This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. All right. Can you please do example 10? Example 10. It's fast. I think that's right. Again, obviously it takes a few seconds longer. I don't think it's uh, hard. Uh, but set up the um, expectations, the receipts. It's interest, 7% on nominal, $7 a year, this time for four years until repayment. Here it's repayable at par. There's no premium. For $100 nominal, you'll get repaid 100 Discount at 10%. My arithmetic is right, I hope. The market value, therefore, 90.49x int. Okay. Is everybody happy? And that's it. I mean, apart from that dreadful start we had, which seemed a bit of a disaster, um... I hope otherwise, I hope you'd all agree, it's relatively easy. All you're ever going to need for theoretical valuations. For shares, it's the formula. P0 is D0 1 plus G over RE minus G. As I said, although constant dividends are rare, it's the same formula, G is 0. But all you'll ever need is the formula. For debt, remember, if it's irredeemable, which is reasonably popular in the exam, it's simply the interest divided by the required return. If it's redeemable, and again, although it doesn't take long, I don't think, it's the one place there is no formula. It is simply set up the receipts and discount at the required return. Okay? Does that make sense? Good, good, good. You better make a note uh, that with debt, usually, in fact, he does have redeemable because clearly he can't give that many marks for any of it, but if it's redeemable, clearly it does take slightly longer. However, um, irredeemable appears on occasions, but also several times he's given you one and not told you. You know, he may just say... We've um, um, seven percent debentures, required return ten percent, and make no mention of when they repaid. Well, you've no choice. If you're not told a repayment date, I think you'd realise yourself, if you weren't told they were repayable in four years, in ten years or whatever, then you automatically assume they're irredeemable. All right? I say you've no choice. Obviously, check twice in the question before you assume that. Clearly, you may have missed it somewhere, but otherwise, assume they're irredeemable. Okay. 
All right, well, there we are. That is theoretical valuation. Um, you'll see in chapter 16 the heading, practical issues, because although in theory all that determines share prices, debt prices, are the things I've been through, the expected future receipts and the required return, in practice, particularly with shares, in practice, things don't work perfectly for all sorts of reasons. I mean, perhaps I'm being a bit silly, but there is no question. If the Queen dies in England, share prices will immediately fall. Immediately. They'll close the stock exchange. I suppose you could argue it fits. It's because people would think, oh, if the Queen dies, England will collapse. Your expected dividends fall, share price falls. Uh, no, sorry, I'm being ridiculous there, but clearly from day to day, there are other factors that can influence share prices. Dividends certainly are one factor, there is no question. If you expect higher dividends, I think you'd accept that would serve to increase share price, lower dividends lower. Uh, interest rates are a factor. There's no question in real life. If interest rates go up, in real life, share prices fall. And it fits, you know, higher interest rates, there'll be higher required returns. What we've done would result in a lower share price. It would. Hello? However, things don't work perfectly. You know, um, expectations are a huge problem. You know, rumours, you get a rumour that companies will do well, badly, you know. All sorts of things. So it's fine in theory, it's not so good in practice, especially, think about this, the main relevance of the way we looked at share prices is if it's an unquoted company. You see, if you were thinking of buying shares in La Telecom, we can talk about theory all we like, but if the price of the stock exchange is $4, it's $4 and you'll pay $4. You can hardly say, oh, Theory says it should be $3.80. You understand me? So the only real time valuing it like that is relevant is if you are buying shares in a company like mine. You agree? Where I'm not quoted. Then obviously you need to put a value on the shares. But surely if you were buying shares in my company you wouldn't just start thinking about what dividends am I paying. You'd think of other things. For instance, if you were buying a majority share in my company, you, of course, can fix the dividend yourself. You know, in the past, maybe, I've been earning 50,000 a year and only paying a dividend of 5,000. But if, you'd, if you bought a controlling share, if the earnings are 50,000, you can decide how much dividend. Do you see my point? Surely another factor, if you were buying my company, surely you wouldn't just base it on the dividends you expected. You'd look at how much the company was worth, the value of the assets. No? Hello? Uh, and so there are practical issues, and although he doesn't ask for valuations very often, do be aware, if you look at page, I mean, chapter 16, you can read page 89 yourself, it's just saying what I just said, really. But if you look at page 90, 90, be aware of two other more practical ways you might go about valuing a company like mine where it's unquoted, all right? Neither of which I'm going to do examples on today because I don't think we need. But do you all agree, if you were going to buy my company, I think one thing you'd look at is the asset value. Nobody, nobody's face moves, which does worry me. Surely you'd investigate and say, what are the assets worth? And if the assets in my company were worth 50,000, surely there's no way you'd get away with paying less than 50. I wouldn't sell. 
Hopefully you'd pay more than 50, but you'd start having to try and put a value on the goodwill. Yeah? But I think you'd be far more interested in that sort of thing than start messing around saying, what are future dividends and so on. You take my point? Now, I'm not going to do one of those. It's very rare in the exam, but I mean, it's a joke. If ever he's asked for an asset value, he's given you a balance sheet, he's told you what the assets are worth. I don't think we need a little example of add up your assets and divide by number of shares. You understand me? Uh, I think that's common sense. I will give you one at some stage, but it's rare and we've got too much else to do, more important today. Uh, the other thing, though, you might consider, and it's very common in real life, again, if you were buying my company, I've already said, especially if it was a controlling interest, then because you could decide on the dividend policy, you'd be more interested in my earnings than the dividend itself. Would you agree? Peter? You, you are understanding me here. It's your face is worrying me so much. No. <laughs> you know, you're not going to look at my company and say, oh, he's only paid a dividend of a thousand. I'm not going to pay much for that. If it turned out my earnings were a hundred thousand, surely that'd be a lot more relevant and you'd pay a lot more, yeah? It'd be up to you later how much of it you took as dividend. Uh, and so... The other thing you'd certainly look at, earn, uh, look at is uh, uh, how much I was earning. And a very common way of putting a value on is what we call a PE valuation. Uh, and here I will do some numbers. It only takes a second, I'll do some numbers. But I mentioned PEs last time. You should all be aware, whether you were here last time or not, um, that certainly for quoted companies, quoted in the paper is the P-E ratio, and the P-E ratio is the market value per share divided by the earnings per share. We agree? It's the current market value divided by the current earnings. Well, the approach you might take if you were going to buy my company, which is not quoted, you might say, ah, what are my current earnings? Well, that's no problem. Look at my accounts, maybe my current earnings are 50,000. Okay? You might say then, well, all right, you're a training company. You might look at the, on the stock exchange and find some training companies and see what the P-E ratio was. That maybe the P-E ratio for similar quoted companies, quoted because they're published in the paper, And maybe for, you found some training companies on the stock exchange and their P ratio is, let's say, about 12. You're all still with me? Well, what does that mean? It means for similar quoted companies, people are prepared to pay 12 times the current earnings. And therefore, you might say, OK... If I buy your company, we'll value it at 12 times current earnings. 12 times 50,000 would give a value of how much? 600. Am I making sense there? In real life, you'd look at a range of values. You might do that to give you one figure. You might look at the value of my assets to give you another figure. You know, you'd obviously look at a range of figures and then start making an offer. But would that make sense as one thing you'd look at? All right? In actual fact, 
Because I'm unquoted, you might say, ah, it's clear where the 600's come from. Because I'm unquoted, clearly in the future it'll be that bit much harder to sell your shares. So in fact, it'll probably be a bit less. Would that make sense? In the exam, that would only be a bit of writing. But I think you'd agree, an unquoted company, you like to pay less than, you know, if you were buying quoted shares. But otherwise, it would give you a basis for coming up with an offer. Okay? Now, for the moment, you're going to have to trust me. I'm not going to give you an exam question now. But occasionally, not that often, but occasionally, and never for the, for the full 25 marks... He's given you information about a company and he's asked you quite specifically what's the value per share using the growth model? And that's simply using the formula. It's taken a few minutes to find what's current dividend, what's the growth rate. You know? But he said, you know, section A, one, what's the value using the growth model? What's the value um, using net assets? And again, it may have taken you a few minutes to find it, but he's given you the value of the assets. You've had to add them up and divide by number of shares. And three, what's the value using um, PE, price earn uh, sorry, based on earnings, he's actually said PE. And again, it takes you a few minutes to find it, but he's told you the PE of similar companies. Again, it may have taken you a few minutes to find what the earnings were, but it was only the time reading it. Arithmetically, it's never been harder than that. All right? So, I say, you'll have to trust me. I think if you, if you are believing me, I think you'd accept that's not hard. It wouldn't obviously be 25 marks. All right? I will give you one at some stage, but not now. However, the reason we've spent that time there on chapter 16, all those little examples, it's partly obviously, as I've just said, he can ask you to get a share price, a debt price, using formula, discounting, whatever. The other reason, though, far, far more important is when we've had a break we use exactly the same logic we've been using, so hopefully I won't need to repeat it all, to get cost of capital. And although valuing shares is not that common in the exam, cost of capital will be there in every single exam. Uh, and as I say, as you'll see after break, the basic logic in getting cost of capital is the same as what we've been discussing. All right? Because that's the real importance. So after break, and for the whole of the rest of today, and a bit of tomorrow, because there's so much involved. It's easy, honestly, but it's just there are 20 individually easy bits, and, it's, uh, and being able to apply all 20 sort of thing. But certainly for the rest of today, and for a bit of tomorrow, uh, we'll look at cost of capital, which has to be there. There'll never be an exam without it. Very often it, it can be most of a 25 mark question. If it isn't 25 marks, it will certainly be part of a question. Uh, it's critical. Okay?